Hey friends, working remotely is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. And as businesses have rapidly transitioned to hybrid or purely remote work, the need for secure, compliant, and hassle-free remote access is paramount. So, what's the simplest, fastest, and secure way to connect to remote Windows computers and apps? That is TrueGrid. It's designed to simplify and modernize Microsoft remote desktop services without the fuss. No more exposed firewall ports or VPN. It's a zero-trust remote desktop solution with integrated multi-factor auth. You've got cybersecurity and an insurance-compliant environment. It streamlines your entire remote desktop access, makes you invisible to potential online threats. Everyone authenticates in the cloud before even getting a sniff of your network. And the real game changer, TrueGrid Secure RDP can deliver remote app to any device with just a button press and no latency. If you value your time, your security, and your sanity, TrueGrid is a no-brainer. So if you're ready to transform your remote access setup, get a demo of TrueGrid today at DemoTG.com. That's DemoTG.com, and you'll get an exclusive 20% discount on your first purchase. That's TrueGrid. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I am blessed to be talking to John Maida, who is the Vice President of Design and Artificial Intelligence at Microsoft. He has a PhD and also went to MIT, which is pretty darn exciting for me to be chatting with you today, sir. How are you? I am so honored to be at the Hansel Minutes show. Thanks for having me, Scott. <laughs> I, I watch all your videos. I listen to all your stuff. Ever since I entered the Microsoft world, I am fanboying right now. Honored to be here. Oh, that's very kind, sir. I am fanboying about you uh, because you worked at the MIT Media Lab for 12 years and so many great and amazing things and people have moved their way through the MIT Media Lab. It was a special place, I think, because the co-founder is a person most people don't hear about named Jerome Wiesner, who was a Manhattan-era physicist. Uh, an engineer. And he believed that MIT had to balance art and science. And so after he became Super Yoda, like retired president, he co-founded the Media Lab as a place to balance technology and art. And that's important. Like MIT had a reputation, has a reputation of being pretty hardcore. How did he, was that a hard sell to push art as the, a balancing factor? Well, Wiesner was really kind of one of MIT's greatest presidents, and he's someone who was known as a, he, he was the science advisor to John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. And so he was someone who could actually make that happen. But most importantly, he's someone who realized that technology, if left alone, can do the wrong things. And he wanted it to do more of the right things. And he felt that when you focus on the arts, you tend to appreciate being a person, like the lights in your studio, I'm always fascinated by your background. You're trying to create an environment, a vibe. Why do you do that? You do that because you're a human being. <laughs> you can't help but be expressive, right? Yeah, that, I, I appreciate that. Of course, we're on an audio podcast right now, and but folks may know that I have these LED lights behind me. And I always have people comment on my office and they go, oh my goodness, Scott, your office is so bright and fancy and whatnot. And the thing is, it's a spare bedroom. It's a spare bedroom, and I just turned them off so that I would see John's reaction. Oh. With and then, but when you turn Whoa. on these fifty dollars lights, suddenly your room goes from a spare bedroom to being a space that is curated and intentional and deliberate for fifty bucks. That's a human who is creative, understands technology, likes to experiment, and that's the artist in you, Scott. I appreciate that. That's very kind. Okay, so let me ask you this though. We're in this world of AI right now. We're in a moment. And, you know, you took that moment to join Microsoft. How, how many months ago? It's now 11 months. So I'm making it up to my first year thing. I, in October, when I decided to come out here and work on AI, all my friends made fun of me because it wasn't the chat GPT moment yet. Mm -hmm. But after December, two months later, they were like, hey, AI is really big. Can I work with you? <laughs> and it's funny how that hockey stick chart happened where data scientists became machine learning experts, and then suddenly all the AI grifters came out, and everyone says that they've been an expert at AI. 
And I would always go and look at their LinkedIn. And if they did nothing or worked in no machine learning or data science space, I would be less likely to believe them. But if you find a data science who's been grinding for 20 years, that's a person that probably knows about AI. How do I separate the wheat from the chaff when I'm thinking about, does the person I'm talking to have a background in AI and can they speak authoritatively about it? Well, that kind of feeds into like, I was from Gen 1 AI. I worked at the MIT AI lab. I worked at Texas Instruments on what was called a Lisp machine, the first chip that embodied AI in the 80s. So I was there during the AI nuclear winter. So this AI is so different and so exciting that um, I'm so glad to be at Microsoft, actually. It's like a great time, right? It is a good time, but it's also very, um, I would say, fragmented. Like, I think we're, you know, this is a public podcast. We're two guys that work for Microsoft, but we're also, I think all organizations are guilty of shipping the org chart. We're going back and forth between there's one org that's interested in AI, and now every organization is interested in AI. And I think we see that at, at Meta and Google and other companies as well. Truce, truce, truce. Yeah. So how do you think we're going to solve that? Is this an example of like, you know, how companies used to have a testing org and now testers are everywhere? Well, I think it's just people to people. Like, I really feel glad I get to visit your your spare room here, Scott, because I think that people create energy. And, you know, we're off the main spotlight here, <laughs> kind of hanging out. Yeah. And I think that's how organizations change, because people choose to hang out with other people. Yeah. And you, you know, calling back to your conversation about uh, the MIT Media Lab and how art balances these things out, that uh, was Wies Wiesner? Who, Wiesner, Jerome, yes, Jerome Wiesner. Jerome Wiesner, you know, thought that that was important. We're we're in a slightly different place now, where AI is also generating art, <laughs> and I wonder if that, like, you were trying to balance human creativity and art with this AI that's going to create Skynet, but the AI can also make art. You know that that goes with the subtlety of art. And I spent six years of my life as president of Rhode Island School of Design. It's an art and design school in Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I, what was it? The, the moment I realized that artists don't make art was the aha that, oh, I thought that artists make art and that's what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, artists think deeply about art and sometimes make art. And so I think generative art movement doesn't impact artists per se in the way that you would think, oh my gosh, you know, what, 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 what will happen to people who make images? Will they all like be upset? In reality, a lot of artists are curious about this kind of way of making things, which is exciting. I hear you, but like pushing back gently a little bit, I think the concern is that someone finds their voice, their design voice, their artist voice, they find their style. And in a world of oversharing, frankly, where everyone feels that they need, whether it be Mr. Doodle on Instagram or someone else who's made a style, whether it be a Nigerian hyper-realist with a pencil or someone else, that life's work then becomes a corpus that the AI can be trained on, and it is the perception that they can be replaced with a button. Well, you know, as someone who dug deeply into art history, and your t-shirt's really cool, so I think you've got some stuff in you too, but uh, art history teaches us that a lot of art's been made, and the art we make now is derivative of that art anyways. So the idyllic idea of making a style that no one else can copy never existed, maybe for like a half a minute. I think it's serious, these questions of you know how a foundation model uses a lot of information available on the internet and who owns it, should it use it or should it not. But I think that artists uh, in the prime of their career are always reinventing themselves. Hmm. I just think we'll have to reinvent ourselves a lot more than we thought we had to before. We won't get away with being lazy. Unfortunately. Yeah, indeed. I feel sometimes, though, that because of the oversharing in social media, which I've said very publicly that is algorithmically designed to make me feel bad about myself, it can overwhelm one. Uh, my son wants to be a comic artist, and there's so much better people that are being brought to him algorithmically to show him that his art is not at that level. <laughs> that when I say, hey, you should tell people about that, he's like, no, I shouldn't. It's not as good as the stuff that's being algorithmically delivered to my for you page. That is the way that some are going to feel if they're trying to compete against whatever the norm might be. Hmm. However, I noticed when I was at RISD, 
I really had good times there. I used to hang out on campus, sit out, sit on the steps with students at like 10 p.m. It's kind of like, just understand like, why are you here? What are you doing this for? And I would always hear how much they loved being with each other. And it was, yeah, I was at this school before and everyone was really competitive and they were slashing each other's canvases at night and it was just really oh, no. kind of like, but now I'm here where we all support each other. So it seems kind of weird, but I think artists love to introvert together and support each other. And I think that uh, your son as a young artist will discover that mode of art, which isn't necessarily competitive. It's communicative and community oriented. That's where the humanist part comes out and the art changes. I like that. There's a word uh, that they use sometimes at Microsoft that can be used both as a weapon or used as someone to lift people up, and it's coopetition. That one, that one. <laughs> you can get artists together and they can, you know, coopetish <laughs> with each yeah. other. And, you know, you're competing, but it's in a loving way and a supportive, uh, uplifting way. And, and isn't that a good thing? Like when like two developers that are either competing each other or they're admiring each other's work like sculptors, mm -hmm. you know, I think that kind of attitude in the creative space is when it gets really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you realize that you're not really competing with anyone other than your your past self. Absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of your past self, certainly people can visit your Wikipedia page and look at your storied career, but I want to talk about how you failed at age 17 when you tried to get an internship at Microsoft. Oh, yeah. Well, that is one of my, you know, I love failures uh, because they remind you, you really do suck, so you better work harder. <laughs> I was 17. I had just finished my freshman year at MIT. I thought, oh, I can get a job locally. So I went to an interview at Microsoft, which was probably one of these buildings somewhere, but it was only a few buildings. And I got there and I uh, was given a few uh, you know, typical programming tests, but I was given the operator precedence test. Hmm. And because I'm dyslexic, I can't memorize sequences. And so I told them that, well, I could type really fast. Like I typed like 120 words a minute. So I was like, I could type really fast and correct it quickly when the compile doesn't work. And he said to me, that's not going to work here at Microsoft. Oh, so no. I didn't get the job. <laughs> that is not inclusive behavior and uh, <laughs> not, a, not a reasonable accommodation from my perspective. Well, and I, so like decades later, I finally got the job. <laughs> <laughs> now you got to go find that person and figure out where they are, what building they're in and just sneak up behind <laughs> them. Remember me? I made it here. It took- Made it. Took Operator precedence. I did it. Yeah. Today's episode is sponsored by Jam.dev. It's developer-friendly bug reports in two clicks. It's free and it's fabulous. You're a dev. You work on a team. Maybe your team sends you bug reports with no details. Maybe text, no screenshot, no console logs and you end up going back and forth just to get the repro. That's when we introduce Jam.dev. It's a free tool that saves developers a ton of frustration. It'll force your teammates to make the perfect bug report. They literally can't do it wrong because it automatically includes a video of the bug, console logs, network requests, all the information you need, even their network speed. It's super easy to use. It works in Chrome. It works in Edge. They see a bug. They click a button. It makes a ticket. It saves time for them, and it'll save you a lot of hopping on calls and meetings to debug. If you're an engineer and you'd rather spend your time writing code than responding to comments, send your team jam.dev. And for the Hansel Minutes listener, take a look at jam.dev slash Scott. Get started with your first year completely free. That's jam.dev slash Scott. So you were at MIT as a student, but then you also were a tenured MIT professor as well. Had you stayed there from 17, but you, you, you kind of came back, you kept coming back to MIT. Oh, yeah. I, uh, well, you know, I got to MIT, you know, we're both from the Pacific Northwest. I grew up here in Seattle. My parents had a tofu factory in the international district. So I really came from basically nothing. And uh, getting to MIT was their dream. And once I got there, I didn't know what to do. I remember like uh, uh, my upperclassmen friends saying, hey, you know, we're taking like the GRE or the GMAT or whatever. And I was like, what's that? And this is for graduate school. And I had never heard of graduate school. So I remember telling my parents, like, there's something called graduate school. And they said, you better go to it, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> so anyways, I, I left MIT, went to work in research in Japan for a while at a media lab-like startup, mm -hmm. and then came back to MIT to be a professor. 
it's been a really fun time. I, I feel very grateful for what I've been able to experience in life so far. Now, back in that time frame, the time you were at, at, at MIT, just to give folks a little bit of context, middle of the 90s to the middle of the 2000s, and you know you were there and Things came out of MIT like processing.org and design by numbers and scratch. And then after that, you were at Reebok and did some computational fashion work with, with the design system there. And what I think is so interesting about that is that it's not AI, but it's still computational. Oh You're gosh. applying computers and numbers to fashion yeah. and to design and art yeah. quite well, early. Yeah. Well, well, that's why I watch your stuff, Scott, because you're so deep computational. And computational stuff, as we know, is artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence sounds like a cooler phrase and confuses people so much. But the kind of rigor you need to work in computation, the kind of like, I, I, I'm going to fanboy again, Scott. I like watch your videos, like, how does he know that? Like, how does he know that? I got to write that down. Wait, he did it seven ways this time. And so it's a fact that computational people have had to essentially suffer with systems that are very fuzzy and don't work all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that the artificial intelligence stuff is a nice, almost branding around how we, what we already knew before. And we were just in early innings still, yeah. but we need the computational thinkers to be better understood. That's why I love your shows because you mix code, you mix humor, you mix creativity, and you're so kind to everyone. So I'm, I'm glad that you have that. That's always a wonderful thing to always see. That's, I think, the beauty of technologists today. People like yourself can do that. And I strive to be one of those technologists too. Oh, I appreciate that. That's very kind. Actually, a couple of weeks ago on the show, uh, Dr. Noriko Arai, who is uh, in the AI space, she is the doctor in Japan who created the Todai robot that, if you recall, uh, attempted to get into the University of Tokyo yeah. using AI. That's right. <laughs> and she, I had I had her on the show. So for folks who are listening to our show, you can go back two weeks oh, cool. and learn about uh, why she thought that balance was uh, important and why also getting people thinking about like, this is a thing that can happen. What are we going to do about it? And giving the humanity back into it. I think that you keep humanity in everything that you're doing. You're not just doing it because let's see if what happens, right? Well, actually, may I ask that question to back to you, Scott? What in your Pacific Northwest journey made you who you are as this person who combines technology and like a good human human humor spirit? Ooh, I'm the interviewer becomes the interviewee. My grandmother was a single grandmother in the 50s, which was not Wolf. you know cool at all. Uh, <laughs> so my dad grew up with, you know, a single mom in the 50s, and he was a firefighter for 30 plus years, and people called him Mother Dave, Aww. because he had a very mothering style, because Aww. he grew up with a mother and with no father figure. But he's also this giant beast of a man with like, you yeah. know, imagine bunches of bananas, except they're yeah. his fingers, like that kind of like a, a, oh, wow. you know, a giant person who is also gentle. Wow. He exuded a positive perspective on masculinity combined with the Pacific Northwest, the hiking and the, and oh, the fishing wow. and the, so like he wouldn't just go hunting. He would learn Native American archery, find a tree, huh. fell the tree, turn it into a bow and arrow and then go and, and then when you get the deer, then bring the deer home, use all of the deer. So there was a, a, why are we doing this for humans, for humans? He always kept people at the forefront. And then my mom was a zookeeper, and we had a real focus on, on again, why are we doing this? Why are these animals in the zoo? To help them, and then so we can educate people so that they can learn about how to be. So I had kind of, I was steeped in just not being a jerk, I guess, with two really cool parents that were themselves uh, interesting archetypes of what a mom and a dad should be. Wow, that gives me chills. That's very warm. Thanks for sharing that story. I think all the listeners now understand why do we listen to scott hanselman <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i just keep coming back to the why are we doing this yes it's fun to do funny technology things to like hey well, why not because it's cool but we're here to help people we're here to relieve suffering yeah i've always said with ai it's about making us into iron man suits not into ultron i don't want an autonomous thing that could go off and hurt people i want to make me an augmented, better version of myself. Mm. No, I see that. 
Well, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting actually. I during the terrible situation in Israel and also the earthquake recently, I, I reminded my my past job. I was in disaster technology, mm-hmm. and every every day I would wake up, and our tech was all about wildfire, hurricane, shooters, the worst things every day. And I feel like I'm so in the AI technology world that I'm so far from those sort of deep human problems. So just sitting with you, thinking about your father and being a firefighter, that really connects me to that world. And so thank you for that moment. Yeah. I I like to talk to people who are using tools or open source to make those kind of things better, whether it be, uh, you know, like there's folks in in, in Nairobi and Kenya that are measuring, uh, you know, voting issues. And then they found that, well, hey, we can measure who's voting and who's not voting, we can go and measure when there's a disaster and, and we can use, you know, geo, we built a geolocation pattern. It's called uh, Washahidi that can then be used to do that with all open source, you know, software. Also, there was a gentleman that I had on, I'm going to have to go back and look at the, the episode here, who had built a system, ODK. Uh, yeah. We talked to Ya Anakwa and ODK lets you do data collection very inexpensively. And he uses that work all over the world to keep you know, billions of people from disease at, at who mapping hot places. Like mm. these are just like, yeah, I could make a blog or yeah, I can make a blog and use that blog to help people. Absolutely. There's a real difference there. You know that because you were at automatic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all about, uh, I, I loved being in the open source community. You mentioned your open source background as well. Uh, I loved how in the WordPress community, PHP stands for people helping people. Because it's people finding a way to a different career in tech, whether they're not a developer or they are a developer. Yeah, thank you for re- reminding me. We, 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 we are engineers with a purpose. And that's very important right now. Yeah, I appreciate that. See, now this is the first time I've ever been interviewed on my own show. So very yeah. nicely done, sir. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I was so curious. So this is no, a chance good. in a lifetime. We'll, 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 hang, out. we'll hang out more. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I also wanted to understand, like, why you're interested in open source and that intersection of open source that we're both excited about and AI. And I know that you're working at, on different things internally and a few things that have been recently released from your Yes, Semantic Kernel is now in beta. It's been open source since the beginning. Well, it's because, especially, I think you've noticed in this AI era, like you're mentioning we're a big company and like all kind of stuff is happening. Hey, did you notice like there's this repo out there by some random person who lives in a basement? <laughs> we're like, oh, that's pretty cool. So the innovation pace, uh, it's, it smells very similar to like the early web era. Back then we found the ability to share so easily, right? And now we can share it easily to the max. And all the latest things that any random developer gets in touch with or small group of them, they accelerate. Many things that big companies are just thinking of and dreaming of, that's exciting. So I think of Semantic Kernel as, uh, I call it boring AI. It's for enterprise. People ask me, like, why does it have agents with like millions of agents using up, you know, gazillions of tokens? And I'm like, well, enterprise doesn't like that right now, but definitely keep working on that because <laughs> that's where we're headed. So we've got these foundational models, some of which are open source, some of which are not. We've got the AI infrastructure that we're running all this stuff on. And then there's like a miracle happens. And then we've got co-pilots and plugins and all that kind of stuff. And it feels like Semantic Kernel is trying to be that, that center router of that stack of, of co-pilots. It's one of the many ways to kind of sit at the center of a stack, either looking downwards into machine learning foundation models, which, you know, you were, you were saying like, Anybody who is working on machine learning for the last 10 years, they deserve some kind of medal. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then looking upwards in the stack, the application le- layer, that's where Semantic Kernel is actually aiming its attention on. The, the average app developer who's like, hey, boss told me to put AI in my app. Oh, let's use this. So the, the barrier to entry for someone to go and do something, whether it be something simple as text generation or something more complicated like a chat completion, uh, or a Hugging Face API, they could go you and can, use Yeah, that. you can use Hugging Face. You can use any OpenAI, Azure OpenAI. You can generate images or text. We're mainly uh, language model focused. And yes, agents do exist, but it's a toolkit to make an enterprise class single agent, not the giant swarm of agents people love to talk about online yet. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning of the conversation, you said a really cool phrase. You said this chat GPT moment. And you also made a comment that AI is fun to say. And again, giving much credit to the people that have been thinking about artificial intelligence since the 50s, to be clear, this is not a new thing. 
suddenly people got chat GPT and AI in their mouth and it had a really good mouth feel and that got everyone excited. So was it overhyped or did something technologically actually hit the same hockey stick on the graph and then go straight up? Well, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know about you, Scott, if you were like me as super naive about these things. Because I remember running Eliza and Lisp, so I knew how to build a chatbot, the old style 1966 class chatbot. But it's when someone showed me history plus equals chat. I was like, what? <laughs> so basically, history plus equals chat, make embeddings out of it, pull things out of it. Like, oh, you can do that now? So I kind of think like last year's moment was because we have the completion models and the embedding models. They both are really good, like a right-hand, left-hand combo. Mm -hmm. And whoever was the marketing genius who failed at the meeting who said, never call it chat GPT, nobody will remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever said, nah, we're calling it that. I mean, people do call it chat BBB, BB8, chat GDP, chat BBBB, but on the average, people do say chat GPT, so what is that? Well, ChatGPT has become a branding experiment perspective. It's like Kleenex, right? It, it's one. It's the Xerox of the thing. So, you know, what my mom called me immediately. He's like, do I want the ChatGPT? Is the ChatGPT oh. in the room with us now, right? Okay. <laughs> but before, of course, like Eliza, as you called out, was an early natural language processing computer program. This is from the 60s. If you could have said Eliza to me in the 80s, and I would have known what you meant. And, and well, and what's important, I think, about Eliza is in the '80s, I took AI from Joseph Weizenbaum. You know, I was like a student who didn't care about like, oh, that old guy, he's not that important. I'll skip his class, and then, oh wait, this guy's really important. Mm -hmm. And as I began to research his career, kind of like like Wiesner, they were post World War II era engineers, basically. And the story goes that Weizenbaum, when he created the first Eliza instance. He left for the day and his grad student came in and thought it was him on the other end of the terminal and began typing. And so the next day when Dr. Weizenbaum comes in, the grad student said, Dr. Weizenbaum, that was an amazing conversation we had. Thank you so much. He actually got scared because he, as a youth, fled Nazi Germany and questioned when technology is misused. So he spent the 70s in the New York Times railing against this future AI technology that could create mass delusion of some kind of higher consciousness behind thinking things like Eliza. Yeah. And he passed away 15 years ago. So if he were still around, he would have a lot to say about this. He would be the person on CNN as the real AI pioneer <laughs> sort of carted out. Yeah. And he'd have a lot to say. Yeah. And folks, younger people and folks that may be earlier in career who are listening to our talk right now might want to go out and Google uh, or Google with Bing to learn all about Eliza because you can go and find instances of Eliza online. And I want you to try talking to Eliza and then compare it to talking to Bing Chat or to ChatGPT and see how you feel. And it really gives you a sense of the slow burn of AI. Yeah, good idea. I mean, because like Eliza uses two tricks, like one trick. It's the first thing you learn how to code at, at MIT. Uh, the first trick is looking for commonly used words like mother. It'll say, oh, tell me more about your mother, Scott. And like, oh, I, mean, I will. I will tell you. And the other one is just repeating back what you said and changing a verb tense. Yeah. Reflexing, reflecting back on people. Absolutely. So you have a background in computers, you have a background in art, but then you were already a professor. Like you'd achieved the goal. You achieved tenured, tenured MIT professor. And you're like, you know, I'm going to go get an MBA. Why would anyone do that? You were done. Well, you know, like you, Scott, I'm a creative spirit. And when you're creative, the suits all tell you, don't worry about the money, Scott. We'll, we'll take care of it for you. And by the fifth person who said that to me, I got worried about the money. And so I did my MBA as a part-time hobby. And it really changed how I began to understand how to read things and read the world. Interesting. And has that been useful? Like, could you call on those skills now? You've got one foot in all of these different worlds? Oh, my gosh. It made me a better product manager. It enabled me to work in venture capital. It made me understand that creative people love to diverge, but the business mindset is all about converge. And converging looks like the opposite of creativity. Mm -hmm. But as you know, in someone who can like, I see you like, 
clicking the button on the podcast, sending the time, whatever you're you're multi you could you could execute, but you can also create. This combo is very rare. Yeah. It was about, I want to say four or five years ago when you wrote How to Speak Machine. That seems like a book that could have come out this week. Yeah, that is a book that came out at the wrong time. I spent six years writing how computer science works, the physics around it, and the lead up to machine learning and what it can do for the world and to be concerned, but be curious. But it came out in 2019. So saying that uh, machines would have living properties sounded far-fetched. Yeah. So have you thought about making version two, changing the cover and pretending like it came out last week? I have thought about that, but my publisher won't let me do that. So I'm going to social media and having a good time and like working uh, at Microsoft (laughs) is like, I'd rather like make it instead of talk about it. Yeah, that's a valid point. I do think that there is a time right now, particularly if we go back to the conversation earlier in the chat here about social media, there's a lot of people just talking. Oh my gosh. You know, <laughs> talking about a thing uh, is not the same as making the thing. And that's why I love watching your videos of coding. You're coding, you're coding with people, for people. You've taught me a bunch of things about static web apps. Oh my gosh, all the different Azure, this, that, whatever. So I'm like, I'm making. I think people who make with AI really are having the best time of their lives, but it's hard to do it. So I'm glad there are people like yourself out there, and I'm trying to be a voice as well. Let's just make with this stuff. Yeah, I appreciate that. Last question. When I was chatting with Dr. Narika Rai a couple of weeks ago, she said that she was worried that AI will make the smart, she called them the smart people, like the top 5%, like way smarter. But she was worried about people who maybe didn't have a good base, a good understanding. Maybe they didn't read well, or they didn't write well, and they might get themselves into trouble talking to an AI using imprecise language. They weren't effectively speaking machine. How do we lift everyone and not just the top chunk of people or the right side of the bell curve? Yeah, I understand that. And also look at the opposite view. Like, I, I don't know what your dad did education wise, but hands the size of like fingers like bananas and he could like, you know, take apart a tree. You know, I, I think there's a lot of knowledge that isn't in books. Mm. And I kind of feel like it's a time for humanity to actually value that ability. Mm. And so, Yes, the top 1%, you know, awesome, go for it. But the quote unquote bottom whatever percent may be advantage because they know how to survive, to your point, catch a deer. <laughs> All these things, you know. it's, I've <laughs> said before, there's not a lot of software engineers on The Walking Dead. Everybody there is chopping wood and doing stuff that I don't know how to do. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, I, you know, there was that the movement. There was a movement, I remember, it was like a blue collar dad's. And oh, it was yeah. a, it was an attempt to kind of clarify that you know someone's kid like they go to school and like what does your what does your father or mother do and oh my father works you know like you know it's, it's stalking whatever and the teacher in that case did not say nice things and so uh, coming from a blue collar dad I have to say and mom I have to say that there's a lot of value to that world that uh, AI will hopefully never get and we humans can enjoy the the joy of those relationships we get to build there. Yeah, I appreciate that. I definitely know that the AI stuff that I work on and that I encourage others to look at, I want it to make everyone better and to lift, you know, a rising tide should lift all boats. And it's going to be both the tech, but also the policy and the ethics that we apply around it to make sure that people are are healthy. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I really appreciate this. All right. We've been chatting with John Mehta, and this has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 